well, I am a real softy for certain types of music, which is one of the many reasons I'm so grateful to Caroline and Duncan. But whenever I hear of the song, Into Each Life Some Rain Must Fall, I feel like vomiting. I've been a pastor about 60 years, conducted funerals, weddings, mourned over divorces, prayed in hospitals and in homes, and my experience of life is the same as yours. It's not some rain that falls, it's cataclysms, tornadoes, storms and floods. The song is altogether inaccurate. Well, how do we justify a God of love if it's a world of griefs and graves? You know, the greatest question in the world is this. What is at the heart of our universe? Is it something as cold and hard as steel? Or is it a soft yielding, warm, sacrificial love overshadowed by wisdom and power. Well, in Revelation chapter 5 it says, in the centre of the throne there was a lamb. Now that is a very startling verse. In the heart of the universe, Christ is pictured as a sacrificial lamb answering your main question and mine. Can God be trusted? Does he care? Is he really good? Yes, at the heart of the universe is one who was sacrificed for you and for me. Some years ago in America, in the middle of the night, the phone rang friend on the other end said, Des, will you do something for me? And I said, yes. Well, I want you to travel 400 miles to a friend of mine who's just been in a car accident and is dying. I want you to go and pray over him. So in the middle of the night, I set off American roads. Freeways are a bit better than Australian roads. But by the time I got there, he was dead. So I prayed over a group of people with a group of people instead and as I prayed, I thought of the many tragedies in that hospital and the innumerable tragedies in all the hospitals of the world. And then I thought of the parents who have their children go to jail because most people in jail are under 25. And I thought of the divorce courts. I thought of a billion hungry people I thought of drug addicts and I realised I was face to face with the perennial problem of every sensitive heart. Why is life so tough? Why is life so tragic? In our previous meetings we talked about when life gets too hard for us, the stresses of life, many of which come from those cardinal things, sex and marriage, money, health and religion, but today I am thinking on the things that just about destroy us. When trouble comes in like a flood and we feel like throwing in the towel. It happens to all of us. Every normal person is considered suicide by the age of 45. There was a great philosopher and statesman by the name of Boethius who was unjustly jailed, accused of treason unfairly, and executed unjustly. But waiting for his execution, he wrote a book called The Consolations of Philosophy. And in it he raised the question, if there's so much evil, how can there be a God? Then he said, but if you are logical, you must also ask, if there is so much good, how can there not be a God? For a thousand people that complain about pain, mystery, sorrow, tragedy, 
there's hardly one that rejoices in love, friendship, beauty, music. The fact is we live in a little tiny island of mystery and we're surrounded by an infinite void about which we know practically nothing. About 40 years ago, 45 years ago, the wife of my youth had measles. The doctor over the road came over, looked at her and he said, you've got a lamp lump in your breast. You'd better go and have it checked. And she was told she had breast cancer. She had a mastectomy and more. Then four years later, she had bone cancer with terrible pain. So they recommended the chordotomy, severing the nerves in the back. It didn't work. I remember visiting her in hospital. She told me it hadn't worked. So they gave her a second chordotomy. Well, now she's a paraplegic. The next three years, I pushed her in a wheelchair hundreds of miles in the woods. She vomited many times a day. The little children would bring the bowl and take the bowl away and empty it and bring the bowl back. She became as thin as a broomstick. Died when she was about 65 pounds in weight, leaving three little children and a husband. Never complained. Never complained. Wrote a testament of faith that was published in the Australasian record. But mine is everybody's experience. Everybody knows cataracts of pain and trouble and sorrow. Some answers we must not give. You must never say, well, it's good for your character. Some trouble is souring for the character. Some troubles are so overwhelming that the sufferer says, if there's a God, I hate him. Don't ever say... The real answer to tragedy is that it's good for your character. There's an element of truth in it. If there were no troubles, if there were no pains in life, we wouldn't be worth anything. We'd be little worms. But it's not altogether true because trouble very often sours rather than sanctify. And never say, well, he or she must have done something terrible. <coughs> That's a hoary old fable that the Bible repudiates in both testaments. Here's Job, a perfect man, so-called. Sabaeans drive away his oxen, his other flocks. Chaldeans do damage to his possessions. The house falls on his children. And then Job gets boils all over, sits in the dust heap, scratching himself 24 hours a day. When the disciples came to a man called born blind, they said, who did sin, this man or his parents? And Christ said, neither this man nor his parents. So never say, hey, they must have done something terrible. Don't say that. Much suffering is vicarious. All suffering is a result of sin, but not necessarily the sin of the sufferer. There is a great deal of vicarious suffering. When a husband and father is a drunkard, the wife, the children suffer more than him because of his sins. Perhaps most suffering in the world is vicarious. But there are two things we know in this world of mystery. One is this. Prosperity is much more dangerous than adversity. Howard Hughes encountered an unusual woman, the only woman in his life who said no to him. He said, you're the first person who in 32 years has said no to me. What a pity that she was the only one. <laughs> He'd have been a much better man if women all the time had said no to him and men as well. Adversity is much more dangerous than prosperity. You've heard of King Midas, given the gift... Everything he touched would turn to gold. Wonderful. Wouldn't you like that gift? No, you wouldn't. You raise your food to eat it and it becomes gold. Hey, I'd rather not have the gift. He embraces his daughter and she becomes gold. No, no. Adversity is to be preferred 
to prosperity. The next thing we know is this, that most of the people who've made a real difference in the world, made it a better place to live in, have been through hell first. Abraham Lincoln had one year of schooling. The girl he fell in love with rejected him and then she died. He had a nervous breakdown, business collapse, failed in politics time and time and time again. Finally he marries and he marries the wrong woman and she gives him hell. And as he visits the hospitals in Washington DC, here are hundreds and hundreds of wounding men no, long, no wonder that Abraham Lincoln looked so terribly sad. But there's never been a man like him. When you read his Gettysburg Address, it doesn't matter what you think about politics, you're impressed that he was a man that knew God and knew reality. Practically everybody who's been a blessing in the world has been through terrible troubles. We all know the writings of Mark Twain, actually Samuel Clements. His father was a derelict, <coughs> morose, never played with the children. Mark was brought up as a neurotic little tramp. In his childhood he saw slaves whipped and men shot in the streets. In his teenage years he lost a brother and a sister in death. And at 23 his hair went white when another brother was destroyed in a steamboat explosion on the Mississippi. The one bright person in his life was his wife. He'd been a, a master of vituperation, he was very profane. But when he met Libby, he reformed. <laughs> he no longer could swear. She was the brightest spot in his life. But it almost seemed that he ruined it. <coughs> The first child died in infancy. The second child, Mark, was responsible for the death because he didn't cover the baby carriage with the blanket out when they were out in the cold and the child got pneumonia and died. The third child nearly died when the pram began to careen down the hill because he'd forgotten and taken his hands off it for a moment. When he was on a lecture tour, <coughs> Another daughter died. Then the fifth death in the family when a daughter had an epileptic fit in a bathtub. He was the man that made the whole world laugh. Did you know that most comedians are often very depressed people? I think of Charles Dickens. His father couldn't handle money all the time the debtor's prison. Charlie was weak, father said he won't grow up to maturity, had fits, dressed in rags, at 11 sent to a blacking factory where he pasted labels on bot bottles from sunrise to sunset. Every day little Charlie went to the debtor's prison to talk to Papa behind the bars. But he wove all those sufferings into his books which brought about reformation of life and manners throughout the British Empire. He changed things for schools, for prisons, and in all sorts of other areas because of his sufferings. You've heard of Dostoevsky, probably the greatest Russian writer. He was accused of treason because of his politics, put with a group of other men out in the snow, firing squad there, box of coffins over on the right. Only moments and he'd be dead. Suddenly a man comes with a white handkerchief, he's released and sent to Siberia. <coughs> on the way to Siberia, at a little railway station, a woman thrusts the book into his hand. It's the New Testament. And through the glazed window of the Siberian snows, day by day before the work day began, Dostoevsky would soak himself in the New Testament. And all his books reflect it. 
I remember when I was at Michigan State University doing a course in Christian literature, among many other courses, we had to read Dostoevsky, and it was profitable to so to read. And then, of course, there's Tolstoy, the next most famous name, who tried again and again to suicide, and always something happened. Tried to hang himself, the rope snapped. Tried to shoot himself, something went wrong. And so he slept with a wounded revolver under his pillow for years. Then he met Christ, and everything was changed. And he wrote that famous book that many people have on their shelves, though they never read it, though it's worth reading, <coughs> War and Peace, and many other famous books. You know these names, but they're all names of sufferers who knew tragedy, all of them. You've heard of Amy Carmichael. She rescued hundreds of children from prostitution, temple prostitution in India, and Japan, but she had an accident and spent 20 years in bed and 18 of those years suffered terribly from arthritis. During those 20 years she wrote books that have been a blessing to millions of people, millions of people. Long before Amy Carmichael was the first of the modern missionaries perhaps, William Carey at seven, he got a skin disease. Doctor said, stay out of the sun. So when he grew up, he went to India. <coughs> Took him seven years to win one convert. And the day he won his convert, his wife went mad. And his assistant, Dr. Thomas, also went mad. So as they baptised the convert, the wife and his assistant were locked up in a room nearby. But Carey helped change the world. In Serampore, he began educating Indian young men and teaching them the gospel at the same time. He paved the way for many wonderful things to happen to millions in Asian lands. You may have heard of Judson. Judson was pretty much a genius at an iron. Anyone with that name ought to be a genius. His father wanted him to be a minister. <laughs> oh no, he said, I'm not going to be a minister, but I will be famous. I'll be a famous actor. I'll be a famous writer. I'll be a famous anything, but I won't be a minister. So he leaves home, <coughs> travels hundreds of miles, stops at a wayside hostelry and is told, look, sir, there's only one room left. Well, that's all I want. There's only one of me. <laughs> yeah, but next door there's a man dying. Oh, I don't care. All got to die sometime. But through the night he hears the moans and the groans and the half inarticulate prayers. And when he comes out in the morning, he's told he died. And he's told where the young man came from. And he's told the young man's name. And it's the name of the young man who had led him into atheism. It is such a shock to Adoniram, he gets on his horse and goes back home, tells his parents he's going to enter the ministry. He marries a beautiful girl, one of the prettiest girls in America. And God whispers to him, I want you, to, want you both to go to Burma. So they take off for Burma. Oh, the sadness, the problems, the trials of Burma, that idolatrous land, that cruel land. Finally, they're put in a hut outside Rangoon. On one side, an awful pit. On the other side, where they throw the dead. All through the night, they hear the wild animals. And then Adoniram is taken and then bare feet with bleeding back over scorching sands. He's made to walk miles till he's thrown into a dirty, dank prison. And day by day, his wife would creep up and plead with the jailers to release him at least for an hour a day, try to bribe them. Then for three weeks, she doesn't come. Then a baby comes, but it has smallpox, and it dies. Ultimately, his wife and all his children in 14 years are dead, Adoniram 
rocks to and fro by the graveside, half out of his mind. Only one thing kept him. He knew God had sent him to Burma. He said, but for my faith and the providence of God, I would have surrendered. I prayed that God would enable me to live to translate the Bible into Burmese. This he did. <clears throat> because of the sacrifices of such men as Carey and <clears throat> Judson, thousands of young men from America, from England, from Canada, from Australia and elsewhere went in the mission fields. Thousands. It's as though God had put the heat on his favourites so that when the story got out of their sacrificial love, there'd be thousands who'd say, we want to follow in their steps. And thousands did. And there are so many moderns, the same story can be told. Some of you may have heard programmes from Joyce Landorf years ago used to work with James Dobson, wrote books. But she suffered from TMJ, a terrible, terrible affliction of the jaw. Went to 18 specialists in six years. Doctors are wonderful. Thank God for specialists. But miracles are usually not in their realm. And month after month, and year after year, she suffered recurring chronic pain that almost drove her mad. TMJ. But she said, as I read Hebrews 11, about the heroes of the past and the sorrows they went through, the one thing that kept me sane was I believed in God, that God had his reasons. Johnny Erickson Tata, you all know about that beautiful girl, dived in the Chesapeake Bay, became a paraplegic, paralysed from the neck down, wanting to suicide, finally starts a society, Joni and Friends, ministering to the, those with disabilities, paints with a brush in her mouth, has written books that have inspired so many with disabilities. So I repeat, well, pain is a mystery and there's so many things we must not say. We mustn't say with Hume, the philosopher, well, God is either all... He can't be both all-powerful and all-good. One or the other, take your pick. Philosophers don't buy that today. No philosopher of note accepts the argument of Hume for a very obvious reason. All of us are prepared to suffer for a limited season in order for a great benefit. And where do we get that from? When people cry out, where was God when this happened? Where was God when this happened to my son, my daughter, my mother, my father? The answer is obvious, isn't it? In the same place as when his own son died. That's where he was, in the same place. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. <clears throat> you know, people have often said the Gospels tell us Jesus wept. They never tell us Jesus laughed. There was a famous Australian painting that shows a kookaburra giving forth and a dead kangaroo at the foot of the tree. And everyone senses how incongruous it is, laughter and death. Why does the New Testament not talk about Christ laughing? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knew our sorrows better than we know them. He came to minister. Only the afflicted can minister the afflicted. Only the wounded can help the wounded. That's why, though the Old Testament said he'd be anointed with the oil of gladness, yet the New Testament does not picture him as laughing because laughter and sin and death are not related. Well, what is the answer, if there is an answer? We had the clue at the beginning. If there is sacrificial love at the heart of the universe, there must be meaning in pain. <clears throat> we may not know the meaning for years, but there must be meaning. If God himself sacrificed, 
with good purposes, there has to be meaning. Unless we believe in providence, life is very hard to bear. The sea of life is salt to every person. Everybody's heavenly landscape has its clouds. Unless we believe in the providence of God, the sacrificial love of God, unless we know that nobody on earth is more than one step away from God and that anyone who repents and exercises faith can in a moment find themselves in the arms of God, unless we believe that life has no meaning. Psychiatrists tell us that the great neurosis of today is the neurosis of emptiness. Men have cut the umbilical cord with God and life becomes empty. They try to satisfy and make up the deficit. Sex, money, pleasure, fame. And if they get any of these, they find it's not what they expect. I picked up a book recently, the Caloundra Library. It was about various famous musical performers and their private lives. And the story in each chapter was the same. That all their high hopes of what would come out of their fame did not materialise. And that all of them experienced disappointment, shame and tragedy. Augustine said, you made us for yourself. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Let me point you to a text that I think is one of the greatest texts in the Bible. Well, I think it's John 18. Notice in verse 11, <clears throat> Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup my father has given me? Well, what's so remarkable about that? Well, why doesn't he say, shall I not drink the cup the Pharisees have given me? Shall I not drink the cup that Judas has given me? No, he says, the cup my father has given me. If you and I could believe that, it would diminish our sorrows tremendously. The cup, my father. On the cross, he begins his prayers by saying, Father, forgive them. And he ends his prayers on the cross by saying, Father, into thy hands I commit my life. He knew God as a loving father. That's why he could say, The cup, my loving father. That's what it meant has given me. When a mother takes the old-fashioned bottle of medicine and holds it to the child's lips, the child will take it, though it hates the medicine, but the mother's hand is holding the bottle. The cup my father has given me. Look, please, at chapter 19 of the same book. You remember that this is the story of the trial of Christ and the important thing to note in the whole trial is the message that came to Pilate from his wife. Now a wife doesn't usually interrupt her husband at his work and if the husband is a, a judge, even less so, but she has a message for him. Here it is. Have nothing to do with that just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. Is there anything as lawless as a dream? Most of us cannot remember our dreams. They're just wisps of memory when we wake up. 
try and trace the flight of a bird, that would be easier than trying to trace the thoughts of a dream. What power is it that can control the sleeping mind of a procurator's wife and dictate the vision of a just man that that day is to be tried and sentenced by a husband? How much control does God really have if he can do that? Someone has said, like many a wife, she asked her husband to do the impossible thing. You can't have nothing to do with Christ. You're either for him or against him. Have nothing to do. She was asking an impossibility. There are such mysterious evidences of providence in the Gospels. Let's look at another one, Mark 14. Verse 13. He said to two of his disciples, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water, note, a man, not a woman, will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. Now, Jesus says, all right, take off. As you enter the city, you'll meet a man carrying a jar of water and he'll lead you to a certain place. And when he stops, you'll talk to the householder and he will show you a large upper room, enough for all of us to keep the Lord's Supper. Now, would you like to risk telling a member of your family, go to a certain part of Brisbane, and a man will step out of a car and you'll recognise him because he's carrying something unusual, and just follow him. And when he stops you go into that house. And whoever comes, take it for granted that he knows why you're there and he's going to show you a furnished upper room. What are the chances? What are the chances? Look with me at Matthew, I think it is Matthew 17. Look at the close of Matthew 17, verse 27. So that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, you'll find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Psalm 8, talking about the Messiah, said he'd have power over the fish of the sea. Here's the one fish that has swallowed a coin that has dropped from a fisherman's pouch and that fish is brought by the power of Christ to that part of the lake where Peter is to go at the moment when Peter wants it and he will extract the coin from the mouth and it's the exact amount that's needed for tax. What are the chances of something like that happening? Come with me to Judges in the Old Testament, (coughs) chapter 7. I love this story and you would know it. Please observe... In verse 13, Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. 
It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped God. Well, he might. He had to be that tent on the outside at the right time, right tent, when the right man would speak, who would tell the right story about the right dream. What are the chances mathematically? Arriving at the right tent, at the right time, <coughs> to hear the right man tell the right dream. What are the chances? You know, the word chance doesn't appear in the New Testament, except in a parable. When you read the book of Acts, it repeatedly says that Christ was taken by the determinate counsel of God. It's very much like the story of Joseph. Joseph says to his brethren, don't be angry with yourselves. You sold me. But God sent me before you to save your lives by a great deliverance. It's a wonderful story. A despised Jew becomes the saviour of the world with the bread of life. What are the chances of that? And I've been thinking this week, as I was reading again the story of Calvary, and one of the verses says, and sitting down, the soldiers watched him there. And I thought, that clicks my memory about the story of Joseph. When they put Joseph in the pit, he's about to be sold for a piece of silver to a foreign people. It says they sat down, probably ate their lunch. They sat down, like the soldiers sat down and watched Christ. You know, the whole story of Joseph is a story of providence. There was a reason that God permitted him to go to Egypt. There was a reason that he was taken before Pharaoh. There was a reason that Pharaoh was so impressed as to give him the supreme task of caring for the empire and its provisions. And he gave the reason, Joseph said, God did send me. God did send me. Jesus, the cup my father has given me. A woman was talking to a Quaker about all the problems and the Quaker woman just silently said, but God said no more. Well, we'd like something more. Something tangible, something visible. But God, but God. He controls the galaxies, gigantic suns, more stars in the universe than grains of sand in all the seashores of the world. He counts the hairs of our head. He says the hairs of your head are all numbered. Mustn't misunderstand that text because in the context he says some of you they'll kill. And you'll be hated for all men. What is he saying? He's saying you will have trouble. You will have tragedy, but nothing I have not screened. Nothing that I do not guarantee will have fruitful results like the thousands of men that volunteered to replace Carey and Judson in the mission fields. Hairs of your head are all numbered. God attends the funeral of every sparrow. Unless we believe in the fatherhood of God and the providence of God, life is very difficult to handle. Remember, it's not who you are. It's whose you are that counts. Remember what I said earlier. No one in the whole wide world is more than one step away from God. 
repentance and faith, and they're in the arms of God. The love of which the Bible speaks is caring, gentle, generous, caring. We all know 1 Corinthians 13. Our love is greater than all the other gifts, suffers long and is kind, envieth not, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. But do you know the context? Paul had given himself for the Corinthians and many of them were criticising him. His bodily presence is contemptible. This speech is Paul. He's not really an apostle. And so Paul, amid the tears of a broken heart, writes 1 Corinthians 13, Love suffers long and is kind. Love envieth not, wanteth not itself, seeks not her own, believes all things, trusts all things, endures all things. This is a man betrayed by his friends. Haven't we all sold Jesus for less than 30 pieces of silver? Yes, we have. Did Christ love Judas? Yes, he did. Had Peter denied his Lord with cursing and swearing? Well, why didn't he suicide like Peter? Because the Lord turned and looked on Peter and all Peter saw was forgiving love. That's all that he saw. There is really no rest in the middle of tragedy except to look at Calvary where a man is rejected by heaven and earth though he's the greatest, the best, the purest in the universe. That cross, the inverted sword of God and instead of cursing his hands are outstretched as if to say come unto me all ye that labour and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. There is no rest for the mind except that faith and providence that Calvary gives us. Unless there had been torn flesh, there could be no glorified body. Unless Christ had gone down into the valley, he could never have gone up to glory. Unless there had been a Black Friday, there couldn't have been an Easter Sunday. But for the brow having the thorns, there could be no crown of glory. As we look at Calvary prayerfully and carefully and sense the providence of God in the most wicked, the most terrible of tragedies, it enables us to survive. Along with the providence of God is the presence of God. Believe that he's near, nearer than hands and feet, closer than breathing, because I've set the Lord always before me. I'll not be moved. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Practice the presence of God. Practice ejaculatory prayer. Most of the recorded prayers of Christ, except John 17, are very brief. Real prayer is continual, short messages to God as one works and walks. Providence, presence, prayer. Have faith in the plans of God. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Peace and not evil to give you an expected end. The plans of God. He has plans for you. He has plans for me. There may be only shut doors. We've all done it. I remember walking the streets of Townsville out of a job. I could have got a job at the newspaper office. My grandfather or great-grandfather had been editor there. But because of the Sabbath, they wouldn't give me the job. It doesn't matter if you're out of a job. It doesn't matter what the doctor says. It doesn't matter what the banker says. 
Remember the Quaker lady, but God, but God, who is our Father, but God. The most beautiful statement I've ever read <coughs> on this topic was written by a man called David Francis. And the, the book was called Treasures of Darkness, based on Isaiah 45, 3, that talks about the treasures of darkness and perhaps alluding to Exodus 20, 21, where it says, Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. But the statement runs like this. The gloom of the world is only a shadow. Behind it, yet within our reach, is joy. There's radiance and glory in the darkness. Could we but see? And to see, we only have to look. Life is so generous a giver. But we're judging those gifts by their covering. Reject them as ugly or heavy or hard. Remove the covering <coughs> and you'll find a living splendour woven with love in wisdom and power. Welcome it. Grasp it and you'll touch the angel's hand that brings it to you. Whatever your trials, your duties or your sorrows, believe the angel's hand is there and the gift and the wonder of an overshadowing presence. Life is full of meaning, of purpose and of beauty beneath its covering. Earth can be your heaven if you understand this. Courage then to take the gifts of God, whatever they're covering, the courage you have and the knowledge that we are pilgrims together wending our way through unknown country home. And so I greet you with the prayer that for you now and forever the day dawns and the shadows flee away. That's worth thinking on. The gloom of the world is only a shadow. Behind it yet within our reach is joy. There's glory and radiance in the darkness if we could but see. And to see we only have to look. The options are very clear about life. We are sinful, guilty people. We are mortal people, soon to die. The undertaker is the only man who knows his job's always secure. And we have an instinct that we are judgment bound. Sinful, mortal, judgment bound. So we can either trust in ourselves and what could be more stupid than that? Have we not all let ourselves down times without number? I certainly have. Or we can trust the world but you'd have to be a child to do that. Or you can trust God. That's the alternative. Remember, in the heart of the universe is not coldness and steel, but the sacrificial lamb of God, so that we can all say, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's in charge if we let him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him. He with me. He knocks. He doesn't break the door down. God is a gentleman. He won't force his way. He knocks at our heart. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? If so, open the door. 
and I'll be your guest, and then I'll become your host. I will sup with him, and he with me. What could be better than that? Let's pray. Thank you for scripture and the story of the cross, which encourages us to hold on when life is tough and difficult, and we feel like cutting the Gordian knot and by some outrageous method, escape from our pains. Help us to hear Jesus saying, the cup my Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Help us trust the crucified Lamb of God who loved us and gave himself for us, who is only one step away from each of us. Amen.